Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today, I have two stories for you from the Nuclear Revenge subreddit. Let's jump right in. This story comes to us from Vladian. A neighbor hit my car and lied about it, so I ruined 300 pounds of meat while he was on vacation. This happened about five or six years ago. For some context, my neighbor, we'll call him Chester, is your stereotypical weekend outdoorsman type. He owns at least 10 different baseball caps, and they all have camo on them. He's one of those. He drives a Jeep, which will be important later, and usually spends his weekends either hunting, fishing, or prepping for when the bombs drop. I tried to explain to him once that we were within the fallout range of a major city, so if we got hit, we'd be screwed either way, but whatever. Everyone needs a hobby, and some people's is collecting canned peaches. Two weeks before the revenge, I came outside to see my car had a broken window on the passenger side, and that part of the frame was dented just above the door handle. I can tell immediately from the size and shape of the dent exactly what it was from. As I said, my neighbor Chester drives a Jeep, and mounted on his front grill is a cable winch he uses for pulling stumps and whatnot. It juts out almost a foot and a half from the front bumper, and is made of solid metal. Anyone with a picture of the winch and the shape of the dent in my car could CSI that crap just from eyeballing it. The dent is almost identically shaped, and situated at the same height the winch was mounted. On top of that, Chester lives directly across the street from me, and he likes to back into his driveway. Conveniently enough, my car is always parked on the street, so he has ample opportunities to hit it. I asked Chester about it, and without saying anything, he shook his head while biting his lip like some clueless cartoon character. I then asked if anyone who borrowed his car might have done it, because the winch itself was pretty scratched up, almost like he's been ramming it into things all over town. Again, Chester silently shakes his head and then tries to tell me it was probably teenagers. No exposition, mind you, he just blamed it on teenagers. I was fuming, but kept my composure and went home to call the police and my insurance company to report it. I managed to get a competent police officer who told me point blank that it was clear what happened, but without a witness, it would be pointless to try and prove it. The insurance agent was equally certain of Chester's guilt, but ended up recommending I pay out of pocket for the repair. Since I was parking on the street, it was a factor the insurance company might use against me if I filed the claim. When it came time for them to recalculate and adjust my monthly rate, I could see a significant increase. A few hundred out of pocket right now could save me several hundred a year going forward if my rate was increased due to my own negligence which is what the claim would, unfortunately, be categorized as. Raw deal for sure, but at least he was honest with me. Fast forward to two weeks later, Chester and his family are going up north to rough it in nature for a week, and despite my cold attitude towards him in recent days, he asks me to keep an eye on his house while he's gone, since I'm the only person in the neighborhood he trusts, apparently. I agreed to do it, not because I had any type of revenge in mind, but because he gifted me a large case of beer for my service. His one request was that I call him if we have any extreme weather, because he'd need me to check on something. Two nights after he left, we had a nasty storm. Wind, hail, and even a few rolling blackouts. The next morning, I called Chester to ask what he needed me to check on, but he didn't answer. Knowing Chester, he probably set up camp in some rural part of America with no darn cell phone service, even though he asked me to call him if this happened. After a few failed attempts, I went over to his house to inspect for any potential issues that might have arisen from the weather. I figured he was probably worried about his garage flooding, since his yard was frequently a moat after heavy rain. I went into the garage, and there was no flooding but something caught my eye immediately. Four large freezer chests lined up side by side, taking up a huge chunk of the wall. I peeked inside one and immediately realized what Chester was worried about. All four of them were packed from floor to lid with meat. Some of it was still in packages from the grocery store, 
and some of it was wrapped in butcher paper, likely game picked up from Chester's hunting exploits. But on the top of one of the freezers was something else that seemed out of place. It was a red solo cup full of frozen water, with a penny sitting on top. I thought that was weird and dismissed it immediately, but curiosity got the better of me later that day when I got home. I decided to Google it and what I learned instantly clicked as a way to get the ultimate revenge on Chester for hitting my car and sticking me with the repair bill. There's an old life hack that people used to use when they went on vacation. You freeze a cup of water, then place a penny on top of it and stick it in your freezer. If your power goes out, the water will eventually melt and the penny will fall to the bottom of the cup. If you return home and the penny is at the bottom of the cup, your freezer was off for an extended period of time, and now everything in it has potentially defrosted and become unfit for consumption. I immediately got up and ran back to Chester's garage to scope out the legitimacy of my nefarious deed. As luck would have it, Chester's circuit breaker was hidden behind a tool shelf, not directly visible to the naked eye. Who would put a shelf in front of a circuit breaker? Chester, of course. So I promptly took the cup out of the freezer and sat it on Chester's porch to let it get a little sun. After a few hours, the ice had melted enough that the penny slipped right to the bottom of the cup. I then put the cup back in the freezer, being very careful to position it exactly where it was when I took it out, before moving on to the last phase of my insidious plan. I started blowing up Chester's phone with calls and frantic text messages. Chester, where is your circuit breaker? I can't find it and your power's off. Get back to me ASAP. I did this countless times over the next two days, before I finally got a call back from Chester. He told me immediately where to go in his garage to find the circuit breaker, which of course I already knew thanks to my prior detective work. I sat the phone down and flipped the circuit breaker twice, once to turn it off and then a second time to turn it back on, giving it just enough time to mess with the digital clocks on all his appliances. And with that, my revenge was complete. All that was left was for Chester to come back home, which took another two days. When Chester got back home, I was nervous, but eager to see if my charade had worked. The next day, I got a knock on my door. It was Chester. He asked me if I wanted some meat to give my dogs. Apparently, the power had been off for too long, and all the meat in his freezers had thawed out while he was gone. So he was throwing it out. I asked him how much he had, and he said it was probably somewhere close to 300 pounds. He didn't want to waste it all, so he asked if I wanted to give some to my dogs. I, graciously, helped myself to roughly half a freezer's worth of meat, some of which I stored in my own fridge, and the rest Chester was nice enough to offer to hold on to in his freezer until I needed it. The kicker is that Chester had no idea the meat never actually defrosted, and was still perfectly good. That night, I helped myself and my dogs to a couple of nice steaks, courtesy of old Chester himself, who was still busy walking the neighborhood, unloading the tainted meat on anyone who had a cat or dog that might want it. It was at least four or five months before me and my dogs went through all the meat Chester had given us. I don't know if I made all my money back for the repairs on my car, but I didn't have to buy any meat for many a fortnight. Opie added an edit at the bottom, it says, I realized after I posted this that I've been living where I am now for at least 10 years, so this was probably 11 or 12 years ago, not 5 or 6. My bad. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Mudkip171, it says, I mean, it's golden, other than the fact that you just forced the waste of hundreds of pounds of meat that had nothing wrong with it. As a hunter myself, with every animal that goes down, I do feel bad for, but I do my best to not waste it, so it's a shame to see so much animal wasted for some self-centered revenge. OP responded to this one and said, I do feel bad about that in hindsight. Fortunately, I don't think hardly any of it got wasted. One of our neighbors has four giant pit bulls, so the free meat was a welcome offering. Not gonna lie, I still feel like a dick though. So somebody allegedly hits your car, you decide immediately that he is guilty based on little evidence, he gives you a case of beer to watch his house, and you waste 150 kilograms of his meat. 
OP, I feel like you went too far, and as you said in your comment reply above, yeah, you are a dick. This story comes to us from No Way 4557 Drive over a kid's bike, pay the price. Okay, this story took place a very long time ago in the summer of 1969. I was about 12. I had an early morning paper route in my neighborhood. One of the first things that I bought with my earnings was a brand new 10-speed bike. It was silver with red trim. I was really proud of it, and I took very good care of it. I also used it to deliver my newspapers in the morning. One of my customers was often leaving for work around the time that I got there. I always made a point of parking my bike well off to the side while I went up to deliver his paper. This particular morning, he turned too soon and too sharply while backing out of his driveway and backed right over my bike, ruining the front sprocket and derailleur. He stuck his head out the window and asked, Is it okay? Not exactly, I said. Well, that's what you get for leaving it behind my car. Then he drove off. I walked at home crushed and upset. I felt helpless against this adult who clearly had no intention of doing anything about it. And I didn't know what to do. My hurt, frustration, and powerlessness gradually turned into anger. I stopped delivering his paper, and when he complained, I told my supervisor that I was delivering, but he'd just like to complain. So ultimately, it wasn't held against me. But the real revenge was yet to come. He lived on the main route through the neighborhood that all the kids took to go to the local 7-Eleven and other places. His mailbox sat on a steel fence post loosely set into the ground. That summer, I got in the habit of pulling it up and throwing it over the fence into the cemetery across the street, maybe once or twice a week. It was fun and mischievous, but it still didn't satisfy my need for revenge. He had three large frond shrubs in his front yard that would grow to six or eight feet over the course of the summer and then begin to die back. They were several feet apart, with nothing else close by. One August evening, I threw a lit match into one on my way home from the 7-Eleven. I never heard anything else, but on my route the next morning, it was just a burnt husk in his front yard. Over the next couple weeks, I did the same to the other two. I was beginning to feel a bit satisfied. But one morning, on the way home from delivering papers, I had an inspiration. I saw that the side window of his garage was open. Now, I knew that what I was considering was taking it a bit far, but I was an impulsive kid, and I thought tit for tat was fair. Back in the day, everybody carried road flares, aka emergency flares in their cars. So I climbed through the window, found two flares, lit them, and stuck one right under and beneath each of his rear tires, then climbed out and hightailed it home and went back to bed. I did not go back to see what happened, and I stayed away from the area for several days. I knew that I'd ruined his tires. I never saw the result, but I didn't care, and I never did another thing to him. OP added an update to this, but it's down in the comment section below. It says, well, I know that it didn't burn because it was only a block from my house, Max, and I would have seen the smoke from my bedroom. Believe it or not, I was concerned about that, but remember that kids in the 60s were more experienced in many ways than subsequent generations. We didn't have cable TV, not even color in my house. Game consoles, video games, smartphones, or the internet. We went outside and did crap, sometimes for 8 to 10 hours a day. Sometimes, it was messing with crap in the garage, shed, woods, or cemetery. I could tell lots of stories. My point is that I was not unfamiliar with the workings of a road flare. They made a relatively small, intense, very bright, and smoky flame. I figured it wouldn't likely damage anything beyond the tire. I could have been wrong though, but fortunately, I wasn't. I really don't recall what happened to the bike. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Genuine Bonafide. It says, I know other people will probably give you crap, but I love hearing stories about kids in the 60s and 70s. Probably went a bit far, but in your defense, he sounded like a butthole. Did you ever get your bike fixed? OP responded to this one and said, yes, 
I found out that a guy in the neighborhood had a bike that had been wrecked. I don't recall how now, but the front sprocket was intact. I do recall that I bought it from him for $10, and I replaced it myself. I already knew my way around a bike, so it wasn't too difficult. OP, I'd say you got extremely lucky that you didn't burn that whole garage down, and we don't know how close it was to their house or if it was attached to their house, so you could have burnt down their whole house as well. I know we do dumb things as a kid, but this one seems to be exceptionally dumb. 